I must allow myself to realize I, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I need to be the one who's pulling out the smarts from everybody else. Business of Architecture, episode 254. Hello, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Sears, and I am your guide to discover the tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared specifically for podcast subscribers by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage projects and your finances to create a more profitable and impactful firm. And as a Business of Architecture subscriber, you can get a free trial by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo and Thank you for supporting this show's sponsor. Sage Glass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent, reliable, dynamic glass. And you've already probably heard of or seen this incredible product. Sage Glass tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views of the outside. Visit sageglass.com to see what this amazing product can do for your next project. So you may have noticed that Sage Glass is a new sponsor of the podcast. They'll be sponsoring a few episodes here. And along with that sponsorship, I also got the opportunity to have the CEO of Sage Glass here with us on the show. So I'm really excited to share with you our conversation. After earning a PhD in polymer physics, today's guest rose through the ranks of several organizations, ultimately becoming the CEO of Sage Glass. Today we speak with Alan McLenahan, the CEO of Sage Glass about his experience going from a technical expert, a scientist, uh, transitioning into leadership and into management, and ultimately running the organization and directing and leading a large team. Now, I thought that this was a fascinating conversation because this is very similar to what we do. We get trained in school as technical uh, technicians, architects, you know, whether we're focused on design or or go to a school that's focused more on the technical side, we are uh, craftspeople, we're artists. And somewhere along the line, if we want to start or run a firm, we need to transition our skill set into leadership and into that of running a business. And so it was very fascinating to speak with Alan about his experience going from someone who was trained as a technical expert that has a lot of those qualities into being put into positions of leadership and ultimately uh, becoming the chief executive officer of Sage Glass. So with that, here is today's show. Alan, welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you very much, you know, it's a great pleasure to be here. So give us a brief history of your experience and time at Sage so we have an overview of what brought you to your current role and responsibility with the company. Okay, well, I'm currently the CEO of Sangoban's Sage Glass. I've been with Sangoban for about 20 years, been with Sage uh, about six years of that time. So when I joined Sangoban about 20 years ago, I moved from DuPont in plastics as a, as a manufacturing uh, manager or leader. Uh, I'm a physicist uh, and a chemist by training at college, but that's a long, long time ago. Um, so I started in materials, none of which were glass. They were mainly plastics, uh, liquid crystals, um, self-reinforcing polymers. Uh, some of the family members like Kevlar materials is where I started my research. And I was with chemical companies. And Sangoban called one day or a representative said, um, you know, would you like to join our, our glass industry and I said I know nothing about glass they said well that's lucky because we've got 350 years of experience in glass uh, but what we don't have experience in is, is starting facilities in in the UK which is where I was at the time um, and I joined Sangoban we built a, a new folk plant a new coater in the glass industry and uh, and I led that business unit for a while um, I came to the U.S. ironically in another part of Sangoban making glass bottles. And uh, whilst uh, you know we believe in uh, glass is a very environmentally friendly material, sadly the industry has been migrating towards plastics for a long, long time. Uh, interestingly, I think that is about to to change again. Um, so Sangoban was looking at its its portfolio, and uh, glass bottles were no longer. Uh, seemed to be a a synergistic part of the portfolio. We wanted to focus on building materials specifically, 
um, and under Pierre Andre de Chalandar, the CEO of Saint Gobain, our, our, our remit is building materials and great occupant experiences, regardless of whether that's a glass or uh, sound cancelling um, ceilings um, or, or plaster boards. Uh, so we are about building materials and obviously glass bottles are not building materials. So we divested that and, um, and I had the great opportunity to move back into black glass with Sage. Uh, we'd acquired the company. We'd been working on Sage technology for 25 years in Sangoban. Sage on its own had been working on it for about 25 years. And we combined two uh, sets of IP and experiences to create this organization and product that we have today. Um, ironically, my initial remit was to help the founder of Sage integrate into Sangoban, which is always tough. If you've founded a company, you've been a, a pioneer in the technology, a large multinational uh, acquires your company. On one hand, you're very pleased that your baby is about to, to grow. And on another hand, you've lost a little bit of control. And uh, you know, you're now expected to provide business reports on a frequent basis to, to people in another country. And, and you're no longer the, the sole uh, leader of that organization. Um, John Van Dyne was our founder. And he elected to, to become the chairman of the board of Sage Glass rather than continue as CEO. Uh, and I stepped in at that point. So sorry for taking so long, Enoch, but that's my, that's my path to where I am today. What was the first position, Alan, where you stepped from a technical expertise area and moved into management? Okay, that was a role actually in Hopewell, Virginia, uh, with a chemical company called ICI Films. ICI was a bit like DuPont, um, British-owned uh, company, but multinational. Um, and um, I, I was in the product development group. Uh, ironically, one of my projects was with Polaroid at the time, and maybe uh, you're too young to remember when Polaroid was a real uh, big business. Um, but we made some of the plastics and the films that went into the final construction of the Polaroid image. And that was one of my uh, projects. But um, the site manager there, saw something in me uh, that said you'd be better in manufacturing and um, and I wasn't sure I must admit you know I, I'm, a, I've, I'm a PhD scientist and I kind of uh, felt that I'd worked all that time to become a scientist uh, that was where I should be working but he was right you know, I moved into manufacturing as a production supervisor um, it didn't have anything like the kudos of telling people that you were a research scientist, you know, but I loved it. And I loved working with the people on the floor and I loved making something. Um, you know, I, I got my first taste of making something through my wife. She's a scientist also. And she was involved in the creation of the very rapid, almost instantaneous pregnancy testing uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And I remember the buzz she got when she saw her product in pharmacy stores, uh, really being sold there, changing people's lives. And I felt the same way when I started manufacturing. I, I could see what I made, see the application, whereas sometimes the R&D development led to nothing, or you couldn't actually point to the work you'd done when, when the finished product was, was finally out there. So um, I got a real buzz out of that, and a real buzz out of working with people and making incremental changes. and. Um, so that was my first experience in manufacturing. So you had invested a lot of time, uh, obviously going to the studies to get a PhD in physics is no laughing matter. And then <laughs> <laughs> going to a company where you're involved in a highly technical sort of R&D environment. What kind of thoughts, maybe misgivings or questions were happening when you were presented with that management opportunity? You know, I think the first one becomes your own self-worth. You begin to define yourself, I think, by your qualifications. And, 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 and I'm a much younger person back then. You know, you mature and you realize that there are there's so many facets to, to us as individuals and, and how we should uh, measure our, our worth. But at the time, you know, you've spent seven or eight years at college. You've come out with a PhD. You've then done another three or four years um, in a very specific field, uh, applying that research. So you, you define yourself in that way. Um, so that was the first question is, wow, am I going to lose who I am uh, by, by moving into manufacturing? I think the second element might be, you know, I, I am a scientist. 
and I make changes and now I will be a member of a team and, and I'll just be a member of a team. And yet that was one of the exciting things when I finally did it. Uh, so those were the kind of misgivings I had. And then, of course, there's the little ones. You, you're about, you know, am I going to am I going to feel challenged enough, you know, mentally? Um, but I, but you are, and you and again, it comes back to a conversation you and I had before we started about you can either see the positives in a change or you can see the negatives. And I think uh, it's very difficult to change the kind of person that you are. I like to look at it and say, well, this is this is an exciting change. It's something different, um, and I found the positives. In, in manufacturing. So those were the kind of thoughts I, I were having. But, you know, back, back in the 90s when I made that change, people weren't expected to change careers quite as much as we're used to now. Um, I, I remember joining my first company from university and people would say, that's a job for life. And that was the, that was the mindset. And very quickly, it just didn't take the 2000s for this to become uh, clear but very quickly you realize jobs for life don't exist anymore and not not just because companies don't do that but people don't want it you know we want to change we want to think i can i can do something different i don't need to go to college or university to to get the skills to do something different i can i can gain that you know either in the job that i'm doing or in in other learning or just the experiences i have so um you know for me that 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 change uh, and the constant change is a good thing. I don't know that I would like to think anymore that I was going to be doing any job for the rest of my life, whether that is one more day or another twenty years. I don't want to think that there won't be other changes coming. You mentioned when you took that management opportunity, one of the things you were most excited about was the team. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that's grown for me as I've become a, a leader and a CEO. You know, back at that point, I was a supervisor. So I was certainly leading a team of, of technicians and operators, um, but I was working in someone else's team. And uh, I think the first things that began to strike me was you know, the, the multiple inputs that quickly come up, down, and across from other individuals. If it's managed really well, it can be really synergistic and you can make big changes and you can actually, you know, be out on the floor working on a problem or sitting in a meeting room and feel and, and realize, wow, I, I wouldn't have come up with that idea. I wouldn't have taken us down this path, but I, I can build on this idea. Or when I've had an idea, you see someone else actually make it into something even better or, 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 or take a few issues with it. So, I quickly, rather than seeing others maybe challenging what you're doing you know, defensively, I found it quite liberating to think that you, know, you could move so quickly if the team was properly harnessed. Now, obviously, that's about good leadership of a team um, and managers and leaders who are actually allowing people to both strike a balance between their contribution, but not allowing it to, to degenerate into chaos. Um, so uh, I guess if that is a good answer, you know, for me, the feeling was um, we're moving faster, you know, than the five of us individually or the 10 of us individually would have achieved um, because we're very open to each other. And I bring that philosophy to what we're doing today and, and, and my leadership, you know, as a, as a CEO of a company, I think we don't see enough humility in CEOs. Um, we don't see enough of them serving their team rather than feeling that the team serves them. And I feel I serve the team. I feel I am a part of the team, even though obviously the title says I'm leading it and people might think they're all serving me. Ironically, I spend most of my day serving their needs. Uh, right after this call, you know, I've had a Sales guy already tell me, I need you to, to speak with me with this potential customer um, rather than me telling him, I want you to speak to this customer. And I think that's the way it should work. You touched on some of this in your, in your answer, Alan, but I'm curious when you say that the key is having a well-managed team and leading people, what would you say are the two top two to three lessons that you've learned 
over the time period of being a manager and then also moving into the CEO position about creating a team environment where, like you said, everyone can contribute to create something greater. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, on, on LinkedIn a few years ago, I posted something that I called ramblings because as you probably what quickly worked out from me already. I can take 10 minutes to give you a 15 second answer. But there were 76 little learnings that I thought I'd had over my life. You know, some of them were quite profound in terms of the way in which you manage a project. Some of them were quite silly, like, you know, keep your passport in the same pocket all the time, then you'll know if you've lost it and don't put it in lots of different places. So I put out these ramblings. Um, and, and within that, it was a great process for me to say, well, what have I learned? Um, because I was trying to share it with others um, as I moved on to a different job. But if I think if I, if I look specifically at leadership, um, I, first of all, you've got to unite people uh, around a clear goal. People will put massive amounts of energy into something um, if, if you've got good people. And in the main, I believe uh, we have good people here, we recruit good people, and they want to do their best. But if they've not got clear direction on what they're doing and how it fits into what the whole company's trying to do, then they're working exceptionally hard, but it will be off at a tangent possibly, and it would only be luck that, that, that it was in the right uh, direction of what the company's doing. So the clarity of, you know, I know, I know the things like vision and mission statements are, are often poo-pooed a little bit. And I confess when I sometimes hear companies talking about their mission, I, I'm a little bit skeptical, but I do think you need to unite a group of people uh, in, in, in the common purpose of the company, and the team leader needs to unite them in the common purpose of the team. So having a very clear, articulated raison d'etre or, 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 um, or goal, I think is the first thing that a team needs. Otherwise, you're not harnessing the energy in the same direction. And the leader is the one responsible for that. Um, I think another one is about ensuring everybody has their, their input. A good leader is able to see when and feel when, when certain people are not inputting, um, but they might have ideas. They just, they just don't have the personality that brings it out in the forums of the discussion um, and finding that way. So, for example, I spend quite a lot of my time on the factory floor, partly because I'm comfortable out there and I enjoy being out on the factory floor, but partly because I want the guys to see that I am not bringing them to my office for discussion. We're going to their office for discussion and their office is the factory floor. Um, and then they're able to actually point things out very clearly, very specifically, that would be difficult to describe. You know, just yesterday, I, I was down in one of our clean rooms and uh, two of the technicians down there were explaining why they felt that a valve was venting the clean room incorrectly. Now, I think sitting in my office here, even them drawing a diagram and getting the line diagrams out of the plant, that would have been impossible for them to explain and impossible for me to understand. But we went out into their forum, it was clear. They felt I was down there really listening to them and I was. They were able to explain it by pointing to it, highlighting to it, not necessarily knowing all the technical terms of it, and, and I could get that. So it's about giving, understanding as the leader, you know, what's the best means for someone being able to articulate their, their inputs. You know, take a bunch of operators who are not used to being in a meeting room and ask them to brainstorm. That they're not in an environment that is their norm. Likewise, take a bunch of scientists and put them out onto the shop floor or, or the warehouse. Um, it's not their normal environment as well. So I think it's horses for courses and leaders actually trying to understand their people and know how best to, to pull something out from them, when to do it one-on-one, -on -one, when to do it in small groups, when to do it in larger groups, you know, not to just a, apply a standard method of, of leading someone. I, you have me thinking about when, I, when I'm hiring someone who's a direct report to me or is going to be a very influential member of one of my, my direct reports teams, a, a simple question I have for them is, how would you like to see me behave in order to get the best out of you? And it's amazing that most people have not thought of that. They've thought about how they'll behave in front of me, but they've not thought what they really want and how they want the CEO 
to behave um, with them to get the most out of them. Alan, you have a lot of demands on your time, I'm sure, as a CEO. What would you say are your primary goals in your position and your responsibility? Okay. Well, we have a, our, our mission statement, the vision of the company is to provide amazing occupant experiences. We make a glass which is very different from, from the standard glass. You know, it, 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 it tints, it can darken, it can clear, you can control it with an app. So it's very different mindset of, of how a window would work. Um, so our goal as a company is not just to say, hey, we're making a new kind of glass. I don't think I'd be very motivated, quite frankly, if I, if I was just making more glass but it's changing the way the occupant experiences uh, the space. So when I think of that um, and what I do, I've got to make sure that I'm contributing to that. So number one on the values that we have as a company is people come first. Every company says it, people are our biggest asset, but I'm not convinced that every company then actually practices that. And, and I'm trying to practice that through the leadership. When I say people come first, I start by meaning our people, each of us, the way we behave with each other, and therefore the way that we behave with our customers and our suppliers and our partners. Um, so I spend a lot of time on people issues. When I have, I have one-on-ones with my direct reports um, at a frequency which is uh, partly dictated by them and by me, what, what they need. Some of them want every week, some of them want twice a month, some of them want once a month, and, and, and we have that uh, one to two hour meeting where we're reviewing every aspect of their, their department or team's uh, responsibility. And the first thing we start with is them. What issues do they personally have just now? Um, how's that affecting their work? How can I help there? Then we talk about their team and any major, normally major issues that, that certain you know, individuals or groups are experiencing, problems they're experiencing, that can be personal if people have been willing to share. You know, they might have a, an ill family member and they're distracted. I want to know how we can help as a company. Um, and it might well be at the end of the day, there's nothing that they feel we can do and there's nothing that we could actually do. But just the fact that it was number one or number two on, on the agenda of our discussion, I think shows people there's a genuine care um, and it's not just, let's just take the box, you know, yeah, we've talked about you, but let's get on to the numbers now. Um, so I think uh, the leader of the organization has got to you know, make people feel that way. Um, I have a lot of um, senior leaders who I challenge a little bit that they are no longer uh, single contributors. They are having to work through very large groups of people and it's the effectiveness of those groups of people that's important, not their own individual performance. So I'm looking for them to spend a lot of time creating the environment where people feel valued. Um, and that's my number one job, that the people in our organization feel valued and therefore they will give more. Now, what that more is, is, an, is another part of the conversation and it's another part of both my and my manager's and leader's responsibility. But first of all, it's create the culture and the environment where people want to do that. I, I, I talk a lot um, on social media about, about the value of Glassdoor. Um, and I don't know if you use that, Enoch, or have seen it, but um, you know, there are many other uh, sites that people can use that, which are similar, but Glassdoor allows you to go on and put a review of the company. As a team member, or as a former team member, or as a prospective team member who interviewed with the company, and you can post a review, and you give a rating of that company, a rating of the CEO, um, and it collates all the data, and it shows the world you know, what people who interact with that company uh, uh, rate them as. I'm extremely proud of Sage Glass's Glassdoor rating, and it's not because we're chasing a number, it's because people feel we're treating them right, and we're treating each other right and it's my indicator it's not the uh, annual um, you know team member uh, development survey that I'm interested in I'm interested in the daily um, changes that might occur on Glassdoor if someone's very unhappy and they felt they couldn't resolve it within our company or they felt they weren't being treated properly wow if they put it on Glassdoor um, it's going to get attention 
um, and, and so it should. So I'm very proud of how people feel about our company and that they're willing to state that publicly. And if I bring it back to our business, if you're, and I don't think a lot of our customers look at Glassdoor as a way of assessing us as a supplier, but if they were, imagine if they saw on there people writing negative things about the company and the way they're being poorly managed and you know this company has X quality problems or you know, never ships on time or people are treated badly. Wow, you're going to think twice about whether or not you want to work with that company, even if they've got a great price and a nice product. But if you also go on and you see, as they would if they went on and looked at Sageglass, the people really seem to love working there. They've got great approval ratings of their senior leaders. Um, I, I've personally got a 99% approval rating by my people. Now, on one hand, I think maybe my mother went in and made lots of reviews and I've been really lucky. On the other hand, I'm thinking, I, that's that's a high goal that I have to keep working to, and I have to serve my people so that they feel that they are, they trust their CEO to guide the company and guide them in a particular direction. So I think that's a very important part of my role as CEO is creating the culture, challenging the senior leaders um, and the and the high level managers in the organisation that we are here to create the right culture in which our team can work. And that will also attract other people to want to, to work here. And a lot of our positions, the manufacturing is based in a very small town in Minnesota called Farabo. It's about 40 minutes drive south of the Twin Cities. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely part of the country, beautiful people. I mean, the, the concept of Minnesota nice is really genuine here. But, you know, if you're trying to attract um, a scientist who's, maybe looking at Silicon Valley as, as the options for them. We have to be different. We have to be a really special place to want to work uh, for them to consider you know, Minnesota, and not just Minneapolis, but Faribault. Um, and we've been successful in, in doing that, and it's largely because of the culture. So whilst it might sound odd that I would spend a lot of time doing that, it saves a lot of time. It makes, us, it, makes it easier for us to recruit people. It makes it the retention of those people extremely low. We have very low attrition rates in all levels in the company. And it means that there's a positive vibe um, about the company um, that our customers can also see. So it translates into, into good business performance as well. So you talked about this idea, this culture, Alan, that is very, very important. And you obviously feel very strongly about it. How you talked about uh, in the meetings, you gave an example of how you ask about them sincerely, their, yes. their lives, their personal lives, their families, and then you move on to the team and then you move on to the other uh, business metrics. What other things do you feel are important to create the kind of company culture that you want where people are excited to work there? You mentioned a mission, mission you mentioned a goal. What are the other more, maybe more tactical things that you're training your people to do to instill that? Great. Um, so I think um, we, we make glass which ultimately goes into buildings. Our guys will make um, thousands of windows per week. And I don't think anyone can maintain their level of excitement for making a window. Uh, so what we do is they don't go through the jobs as windows. They go through the plant as a named job, a named building where there are images on the screens of the plant and there are images in the daily reports of the building that we're creating, not the glass that we're making, what it's going to ultimately look like both from the inside and outside. So we normally have the artist's renditions or maybe our own modeling team can put one together if it's a small building so that we're showing people, this is the space that you're helping make. You're not making a window. We're making something very special. Um, and this is, this is the space that it's going to ultimately go in. So we tell them a little bit about that. When we have a quality issue or a problem on a job, and we have that, we share that very openly with people so that the whole team can realize that wasn't just a defect on the glass or it, didn't, uh, it wasn't as uniform in its color as another piece of glass right beside it. It was the way it affected uh, the person in the building. So again, we connect the people to the people and we look for that ownership. We have a, 
a, a, a vice president of customer experience. Now we are a relatively small company on the big scheme of things. You know, we're we're um, a very new, relatively new technology for the glass industry. Um, if we were at absolute capacity and our competitors were at absolute capacity, we could satisfy about 0.0001% of the global facade glass market. So we're tiny, but we've still created a customer experience role because we think of ourselves a little bit like Aston Martin uh, as a car as opposed to Ford. And both are amazing companies doing different things, serving different markets. But when you buy a Sage glass window, there's no doubt it's more expensive, it's more interactive, there are controls associated with it, there are things that you see changing in it. Um, so you, you have a higher expectation of it, as you probably would if you bought an Aston Martin. You'd have a higher expectation of that car than you would of a Ford Focus, even though the Ford Focus is a great car. So we're trying to let our people know, uh, you know that someone's paid a lot of money for this and they have a high expectation for it and we want to ensure that that experience they're going to have with it is great. So customer experience goes across every single department um, and every department and every team, whether it's a, a, a shift uh, on a cutting area of the plant or whether it is the project management team who go out and commission uh, the, the Sage Glass in a building, they have customer experience goals. And I don't mean some net promoter score that everybody gets frustrated by. I mean genuine goals where the customer is making a, a proactive statement about the experience that they had or that we are ensuring that uh, if we commit to a delivery date, that delivery date is met, no matter what internal problems we encounter. You know, I, I, I know that in you and I thinking about this uh, conversation, you know, one, one of your questions was um, how do we actually ensure that we are um, you know, satisfying the customer and thinking about the customer. Um, we are, are understanding that we are committing to doing something and we have got to deliver on that. And I want that to really feel deep into the organization. I don't want anyone saying, well, that's not really my responsibility. Um, the, the shipment didn't leave on time, but that's not my responsibility. I want us to think, what, what will happen if I don't do this today? I know I have to make this. I've not been able to do it. What's the repercussion of that? And have them own that. Um, even if they're changing shift uh, or they're going home for the end of the day, it's ensuring that it's not just lost somewhere. Ah, oh, someone else will pick it up. But what if someone doesn't? What if our systems fail us? Um, I want people to feel that. Um, and, and think of it that way. So that's why we have customer experience goals uh, for every department, uh, even though the external customer may never see the, 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 the goal directly. If we achieve those goals, their experience ultimately will, will be better. Um, yeah. Tell me, how do you measure that customer experience goal? You mentioned net promoter score, so you're not doing that. You mentioned something about customer calls. Tell me more uh, exactly how you do that. Yeah, you know, I mentioned net promoter scores, and, and, but we do do it. Uh, I just hate them. I, uh, at a very personal level, you know, and let me use a silly example. You, you, you take your car in for a, for a normal service, normal oil change or whatever, and then they'll call you back later and say, were you delighted? with your oil change and I'm like whoa listen to what you've just said how sad is my life that you think i should be delighted with an oil change in my car i am satisfied with what you did um but you're asking me if i'm delighted no i'm not delighted i'm sorry i might have been delighted if i'd gone and seen an amazing play and i thought wow that was just like that just blew my mind but getting my oil changed. So I try and keep these things in perspective. And, and I want to ensure that the company who works with us, who reaches out to our customers you know, during the experience of, of buying the glass and installing the glass, after the experience that they've had working with us, and then the final occupant's experience, the company who will reach out to those people we are ensuring they have our values. They are not going to ask a stupid question like, were you delighted with the experience with the Sage Glass project engineer? It will be more uh, specific. You know, 
did the Sage Glass project engineer listen to your needs? Yes or no? Not you know, score them one to ten on what is a yes or no answer. So I'm pretty down on the net promoter stuff. Um, and I want these simple yes or no. Yes, we did it. No, we didn't do it. If we didn't do it, is there more specific that you care to share? And try and keep it into perspective. Nobody wants to spend 20 minutes doing a survey on the windows they bought. They want, it's got to be crisp and sharp um, so that we're not wasting their time. If they want to share more with us, absolutely. But we're not assuming that because you bought Sage Glass Windows, you're going to spend 20 minutes describing the experience to us, you know, six months later. Um, so it's to try to take the customer into even that consideration. You know, we're respecting the customer by, by not badgering them uh, to, get, to get that data. Um, so within every department, there's actually a measurable. So uh, it could be as simple as, um, you know, an, an, a mini on time and full delivery. We have seven major steps of the production process. And obviously step five is handing product on to step six. And they have a measure. Did they meet the target of the day? It doesn't need to be that they, um, they exceeded that goal, but we committed to make you know, 800 devices um, on that shift. Did we do 800 devices? If we didn't, um, what, what action did we take? I expect to see in the detailed handover reports, hey, we, we are two devices short, um, and the next shift has picked up that issue, and when the next shift issues its, its report, it's picking up on those two issues right away, rather than it saying, oh, we did our 800, we met our goal, what that shift needs to do is find a way of doing 802 and catching it back up, or ensuring that those two that failed didn't just keep failing for the next 10 shifts, and someone said, well, you know, I didn't have it on my initial list, so I just left it. Um, so we try and put these specifics in place uh, that, are, that are for the department. You know, a project manager going on site, it can be as simple as, did you let the, the general contractor know when you left the site? Um, you know, before we introduce things like that, sometimes people would just leave the site. They'd done their job and they did it well and, the, and our part was done, but we'd not told anybody we were gone. And they were saying, have you finished? Uh, are you done? Um, so we have this, you will end the visit, clearly stating whether it is verbally, uh, personally, by text, by email. We won't prescribe it as long as it's what the customer wants, um, that I'm done and these are the outstanding issues and this is what I'm going to do about them. Or I'm done, the system is now functioning, and if you need anything else that's not already been explained, this is my number. That, that's a simple customer experience thing. We're not you know, getting in their way, but we're letting them know we've definitely done what we came to do um, or we have not done that. So we try and put those measures in place, you know, as I try and find an example in a few parts of our, of our business. Sure. Thank you for that. It's intriguing to me. I was excited to talk to you, Alan, for especially because you are someone who has a very technical background and you've moved into management and it's a okay. lot like my audience architects, right? So architects, very technical degree. They're very creative at the same time, a lot in common yeah. with probably what yeah. you did as a technician. But then when they discover that they are moving into management or into uh, owning a business, it's a whole different ball game. So yep. tell me, I would like to get some insight from you about what it was like, what are the differences between being an operator and a technician? What are the most important qualities that you found you need to have to move into a completely different role as a CEO? Yes, I think the number one is get away from the detail. You know, don't be, don't be afraid of the detail, but you can't be in the detail of everything. Um, be able to take a slightly bigger picture of what the issues are and what is the business here to do? Um, rather than, um, I know the torque that should be placed on the spacer bar for a 12 square foot unit being installed in the fourth floor of a high rise in Miami with the hurricane rated glass on it. <laughs> that there are people who will be exceptionally good at that. Um, so you need, to, you need to be okay with moving away from the detail. Bring in, bring in people on the team at all levels who you trust and who trust you. Uh, because, you know, the number of times that we will say, uh, that we, we're hiring amazing people, but then we micromanage them and we don't really let them be amazing. Um, 
uh, that happens too often. So number one for me is don't be afraid to get away from the detail. In fact, you've got to get away from the detail a little bit. Um, uh, make sure that probably as a scientist, um, my EQ um, as a young man was probably not great. I look back on myself. Define EQ for us. So if, if IQ is your intellectual quotient, then EQ would be your emotional quotient, your, your, your ability to connect with people, your ability to empathize with people, your ability to understand uh, people, not from a, a psychologist's perspective, but purely, you know, how, can, how do I get the most out of people? Um, and how do they get the most out of me? So um, I, I think many people with, with high IQs scientists, engineers, architects, they, they define themselves with that IQ. And then they have to say, well, actually, I've, I've got all these other people who are doing that for me now as I'm now running the company or I've started my own architectural firm and I need to let them do that. But I, I, I must allow myself to realize I, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I need to be the one who's pulling out the smarts from everybody else. Um, not, not the one who is the smartest person. I, uh, I'm, I'm really comfortable in, in my older age that in most of the rooms that I sit in, I'm, I know I am the dumbest person in the room from a pure IQ perspective. I've got some amazing physicists and engineers, software scientists. I don't understand most of what they say. And I'm okay with that. My job is to pull it all together to make sure that at the end of it all, we're either delivering on a project, we're improving the customer experience, we're changing our product for the better, um, that there's a robust methodology being used, a system being deployed. I, um, I heard recently, uh, and it was, it was not a direct competitor, but it was from a competitor's um, a team member, and they said that they one of their frustrations was they were constantly rushing to the next problem and not deploying any systems. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I bring as, as a leader who's moved away from the detail is to look at it and say, we need a systematic approach here, whether that is a, a data-driven system, whether it's new software or whether it's just a methodology. I'm looking at something, hold on guys, we don't need to be learning this mistake again and again and again. Every time we bring in new people, every time we, do a, another project. So, you know, something like our, our product development process is quite a rigorous stage gate process. Um, I don't understand all the technology that's going on in the product itself that they're working on. But what I am asking is, um, you know, has it passed the following compliance test? It's a tick in the box. It's, it's asking the detailed scientist who's really excited about the lithium or the tungsten oxide layer being changed, asking them, has it gone through these compliance and durability tests before we can allow it to go to the next stage? Is the system being used? Now, I don't want to restrict creativity and innovation by putting systems in place. And I don't even want the scientists constantly thinking, oh, um, what's the system? How does the stage gate work? I want them to be creative. And that's where maybe myself, or, or, a, or a senior leader is going to bring that to the steering committee um, and ensuring that we're, we're not just launching brilliant ideas into the marketplace, we're launching robust products that contain the brilliant idea. Um, I'm sure that none of us would be happy if we bought our cell phone and, on, and once we opened up the box, it simply said, this cell phone has a 92% chance of not working, but it contains 72 brilliant ideas. <laughs> We'd not be interested in it. What it needs to be is that cell phone contains 72 brilliant ideas and it works robustly every time under all the conditions that we will throw at it. So it's those type of things that I think uh, I might bring. Um, EQ as well, you know, reading a room, Seeing that someone's not happy about something, but they're not saying it. Um, I spend a lot of my time in rooms just looking at eye contact. I'm not a body language expert by any stretch. I'm not saying, you know, that's what I'm doing, but I'm just saying that person doesn't look like they feel happy with what was just said. And maybe they're not someone who's loud. 
you know, we, we're an international company. We have a lot of WebExes, a lot of conference calls. I'm trying to make sure that if the conference call is being hosted from San Francisco and I've got someone on the line from China and Paris or Minnesota, the first point is I'm ensuring, I'm checking, hey, John, Chicago, what's your thoughts on this? So that they don't just get lost because they're not in the room. Um, and I'm trying to pull out uh, and give the person a very specific opportunity to speak. Everyone else uh, has heard me say it and seen me say it. I'm now asking John to contribute um, as opposed to just, does anyone else have anything else they want to say? I mean, that's just like nothing. If you don't, if you don't feel you have the, um, the uh, personality to come out and challenge someone on something, you won't do it if it's just a general request. So I think as the, as the leader and CEO, it's coming back to people again, ensuring that the right forum is there for people to, to express their input. Um, we have an R&D manager that she introduced this to me, and I, and I love the concept. I wish I'd thought about it sooner. Um, she has a lot of our meetings walking the campus. She hates using meeting rooms. She hates using PowerPoints. Um, they will actually walk outside around the buildings and up and down the street. Um, and I just think, wow, it's healthy and we're, we're, we're exchanging more. And, you know, most of the time you don't need the PowerPoint either. And if you do, you can both have it on your tablet. Um, and our Wi-Fi works to the boundary of the properties anyway. Wow, what a cool way to have a meeting. Um, now, if you'd asked me to do that, I'd have said, oh, you know, we can't have this meeting today because all the meeting rooms are full. And uh, she thinks, well, we're not having a meeting because the meeting rooms are full with other meetings. Why can't we just go for a walk? That's a bloody great idea. <laughs> Alan, what would you say would be the number one thing, if you had to pick one, to increase your intelligent, uh, your emotional intelligence quotient? your EQ listening listening and what's the one thing that you would suggest that someone can do to improve their ability to listen um write write down what you want to say next um I think a lot of time people jump in because they are fearful that they'll forget the conversation kind of moves on the subject moves on and they think oh I'll, I'll forget to say that so they're jumping in and they're talking again I, I I just try and write it down I keep my little book and during the meeting, I, I hope I'm quite quiet for a lot of the time and I'm writing all my questions. And you know, the funny thing is, you maybe write down 10 points or questions and you find out you're scoring eight of them off because someone else asked it or it got answered anyway. Um, so it's not, it's to listen, it's number one. And then you hear other people's opinions an awful lot more. Um, and your tool for listening is prevent yourself from jumping in, prevent yourself from trying to be the smartest person in the room. If you, if you know you're smart uh, and you also maybe feel that you define yourself by being smart, then you're going to have to resist the urge to show people how smart you are. Um, and, and, my, and, and, and my way of doing that is I write down what I want to say and normally it's already been covered. By the time we get to the end, normally someone else in the room has asked the question or made the statement or clarified my point, and I've maybe only got one or two items that I'm left with, and, I, and therefore I've listened. Um, and rather than, you know, when, I, when, I'm, when the CEO's in the room, I, I, I don't think of myself as a CEO. I don't go to bed at night. I don't, I don't take my close off at the end of the day thinking I'm a CEO I just think I'm a human being who's tired at the end of the day and I don't look quite as fit as I should um, if but you've got to remember that other people are sat in the room thinking he's the CEO and their dynamic with you will be influenced by the fact that the title is in the room so if I say something I've got to be really aware that it will influence how others will react some people will want to disagree with me just for the sake of it some people will feel well alan's already said what he thinks so that's it anyway um even though internally i don't believe that's the way i am i i don't know how others perceive the role of a ceo whether it intimidates them whether they think i'm just a waste of money 
So I, I don't prejudge that. I know, look, people are going to look at the fact that the most senior person in the room happens to be me today. Um, if I'm not in the room and it's one of my leaders, then they have to think the same way. They have to think, I, I could influence things here. Um, I, I don't want to change the potential outcome just because I happen to say something. We have a process when we're recruiting people, very simple process. Everyone who's seen uh, the, the person at, at that stage in recruitment is asked just to, just to provide the feedback to HR. Um, the first question is, was the candidate, um, um, oh, what's the word we use? It's not viable. It's, um, oh my word, it'll come back to me. I'm, I'm sorry, Enoch. Um, and we all answer the question, but we're not allowed to copy our answers to everybody else because we don't want to start influencing each other. And I normally wait at least a day, not because I'm lazy, but because I don't want even HR seeing what Alan said, yes, um, and uh, everybody else wants to say no. So be aware of how you might influence others. That applies as the leader, but it probably also applies uh, to all of us, but the title changes something. You know, the CEO title makes people think, well, that's what's gonna happen, the CEO said it. Now, the one caveat I would throw to that is, in my leadership meetings, the senior leadership of the company, I don't run a democracy. Um, I am asking everyone for their input and for all of us to discuss, you know, challenge each other. Um, and sometimes I'll ask for, for votes on a topic, but mainly I'm going to make the decision. Um, and that's not because I think it's my personal decision. It's because I'm the one collating the information, collating all the views. You know, manufacturing want to do something. Sales want to do something. Marketing feel this should happen. Oftentimes they're at odds with each other. You know, let me give something simple. You know, our manufacturing plant loves making squares and rectangles. It's easier for them. They hate doing triangles and trapezoids and stuff like that. The sales guys love selling triangles and trapezoids because you sell them for more. And uh, the architects and the designers love doing triangles and trapezoids because it gives a little more flair to the building. So there's a balance point to be had. I, um, and I don't give it to the manufacturing guy to make the final decision. And I don't give it to the, uh, to the sales guy to make the final decision. We want to hear all, all the case for it. Um, we did a job some years ago. I always remember it. it, it, it you're, you're architecturally trained, Enoch, and I will probably offend you with this comment, but it's my, my bad Scottish humor in, in dealing with architects. We, um, it, it's the Frost School of Music. I'll, I'll be specific about the job. It's a beautifully designed building, and it has large triangular sage glass windows in it. And I remember at the time, the sales guy telling the architect and the building owner, uh, you know, the triangles are going to be really expensive. Um, they're probably going to be the same price for two triang uh, for, for one triangle than it would be for a, for a rectangle that would be the size of two triangles. And he said, no, 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 I want, the, I want the triangles, no problem. Boom, that's what we did. And then he put two triangles together into most of the world it just looks like a big square. But in the architect's mind, it's two triangles. So, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> But it is a beautiful building, with or without the sage glass. Great. We'll see if we can dig up some pictures of that to put it on the show notes for today's show. Uh, in other things that we mentioned, I want to point out to our listeners, I'm going to put a link to your ramblings, Alan, which I've taken a look at Thank them, you. and they're, they're quite, quite profound, if I don't say so myself. Some are obviously, kind of, yeah. might, might be considered trivial, um, yes. like keep a toothbrush or toothpaste in your desk or locker. Um, but others yes. um, would be considered very, very profound, like you'll never regret having spent too much time with your kids. So I'll put a link there because we value your insight. We value that you took the time to write that down for the world, and um, we respect that. So thank, thank, you. You for, thank you for being on the show today. It has been a pleasure, Alan. And I mean, I could go on. We could, I could continue to grill you for hours on end probably, but I know that we both have to commit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Enoch, for uh, allowing me to ramble for the last, uh, last hour with you. And that is a wrap. To discover how to create a better firm that runs practically on autopilot without stress and without fires, I've prepared a special webinar for uh, podcast subscribers. You can go register for that 
at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. That's about a 60 minute online training uh, where you'll be able to discover how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale and grow uh, revenue and your income without chaining you to your desk. To discover how to market your firm to win better projects, I've prepared another special presentation that you can sign up for over at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage all those products you have going on and make sure that you're getting paid on time to be able to create a profitable and impactful firm. You can, as a Business of Architecture subscriber, you can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage glass is a special kind of glass that tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views to the outdoors. You may remember a similar effect in the movie Blade Runner, where Deckard meets with Eldon Tyrell for the first time. Tyrell wants Deckard to do a replicant test on Rachel, his assistant. Deckard says, it's too bright in here, and Tyrell obscures the sun shining through the window with a touch of a button. Uh, Classic, classic scene from a fantastic movie. Well, the future is here. Sage Glass gives you the freedom to design beautiful buildings unconstrained by the sun. You can create better, more sustainable spaces for people to learn, create, heal, and work. Visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment for yourself. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.